I drive a 2010 Toyota Sai. It's a hybrid that's not a Prius, and it's the sort of car that you buy if you don't want to think about owning a car. And I don't really care much about cars. When I was a kid, my friends would debate over whether an Audi or a McLaren was cooler, but the only car I cared about was this truck parked next to the SSN, which if you used strength on, you'd get to battle Mew, which turned out to be a lie. I'm happy with my car and its features. There's an ambulance button on it, which speaks at me in Japanese when I press it. And the map system puts me somewhere in Japan, which was really cool during COVID travel restrictions when we weren't allowed to travel internationally. It also has cruise control, not adaptive cruise control, just regular conventional cruise control. You set it at the speed you want to go, and regardless of whether you're going up or downhill, the car will either brake or accelerate to maintain its speed, but you have to watch out for slow moving vehicles ahead because the vehicle is blind to them. If you've watched any of my videos about the SAE levels of autonomy, you'll know that that puts the vehicle square in level 1, since it takes over the braking and acceleration for a prolonged period of time, and I was confident in this knowledge for years. Until Jono from Megalag released a video over a year ago discussing the levels of autonomy. In the video, Jono described conventional cruise control as level 0. However, level 0 vehicles by definition can have some limited autonomous features. For example, cruise control. Level zero. My 2010 Toyota Sai, a level zero vehicle, I wasn't gonna let some expat Kiwi with gorgeous hair who's probably forgotten what a Fijoa even tastes like speak about my car like this. So I jumped in his comments and we wrote novels at each other, but Jono got the better of me. He pointed me at note 3 in section 3.28 of SAE J3016, which read, Conventional cruise control does not provide sustained operation because it does not respond to external events. It is therefore also not classifiable other than at level 0 under the taxonomy. And just like that, it was over. Jono had whipped all that I knew to be true with a flick of his beautiful hair and I was left with a pathetic 11 year old level 0 vehicle which was no different in SAE level to the Model T from over a century ago. I'd lost. And the only way I was going to get up the SAE levels again was to just buy a new car. But then I thought no. This is the internet. No one admits to being wrong on the internet. Could I be mistaken about the SAE definition of my car? No, it's the globally recognized standard which is wrong. So for the last few months, I've been secretly worming my way into the depths of SAE so I can change the most important standard for the self-driving car industry and twist it for my own personal gain and to prove someone wrong on the internet. This was a heist and justice for cruise control is my treasure. But like any good heist, we need a plan. To change a standard, you can't just change it on a computer. They're PDFs and everyone knows it's impossible to edit those. So we need to go to where the PDFs are made. And for that, we need to join the Society of Automotive Engineers, the SAE. Change my title to doctor on all profiles to better camouflage myself amongst experts. Find out who was in charge of SAE J3016. It's ORAD, or the On-Road Automated Driving Technical Committee. A group of people from industry who meet every month to establish, delegate work on, and vote on standards that are then adopted. Bingo. We found our target. Find out who chairs this group. George Nichols. Toyota Motors. But who are you, George? Borderline stalk George to find out more about his background. Cool guy. Smart guy. He's been at this for years. Set up a meeting with George. Feels like a job interview. Goes well. Learn from George that the people who work on the standard aren't necessarily the technical committee, but the task forces. The task forces are the ones who actually write and modify the standards, and the technical committee are the judges at the end who accept or deny them. You don't need to be part of the technical committee to join a task force and contribute to a standard. I had gone in too deep. Pull back a bit and ask to join the definitions task force. Get accepted. I'm in. Definitions Task Force meets once a fortnight for each standard. Most members are from America. I'm the only one from the Southern Hemisphere. It means I need to wake up for 6.30am meetings every second Saturday and 5am every second Wednesday. Do that. Hate it. But I'm not going to let Jono be right. Attend a few meetings and really participate and contribute. Fall asleep sometimes. No one notices because everyone's cameras are off. Lucky. Notice that all the work items that the Task Force works on are from a document called The Parking Lot. It was right there all along. Hiding under a pun. Cute. That's it. That's our target. If we want SAE J3016 changed, we're going to have to add it as a work item to the parking lot. 
we do that, argue our case in front of the task force, and if enough of them buy it, Jono is humiliated, and I win. <laughs> now that we've identified where we need to ask for our changes, we need to decide what our changes are. And secondly, ensure that we have solid reasoning behind it. The people on this committee are well specialized and not just regular members of the public. These members know the ins and outs of the standard better than anyone, so a flimsy request is unlikely to be successful. We know what change we'd like to make, and that's note 3 in section 3.28. Note 3 claims that since conventional cruise control does not respond to external events, then that makes it level 0 since it fails the test for sustained operation, which is a requirement to be covered by the SAE levels. Adaptive cruise control changes its speed to match the vehicle in front of it, whereas conventional cruise control won't. That's the only difference. Obviously when this was written, other cars are the external events that are being referenced. But when operating both adaptive cruise control or conventional cruise control on a road with no traffic, they behave in an identical way. My view is that the operational design domain, the conditions for which the system is designed to operate, video here, for adaptive cruise control and conventional cruise control are different. Section 3.21 defines the requisite presence or absence of traffic as a characteristic of the ODD. Judging the behaviour of a system on conditions outside its ODD isn't something that should be standard unless you're a Tesla stan on Twitter trying to downplay the impressive work that the rest of the industry has done on actual automation, and I wasn't going to let them do my 2010 Toyota side dirty like that. However, even if we're going to let that slide, conventional cruise control does respond to external events. These events aren't other vehicles, but they're the changing topology of the road and weather conditions. When you set your speed with conventional cruise control, and you're going up a hill or the wind starts to blow against you, the car applies more throttle to meet the speed which you've requested. When you're going downhill or the wind is behind you, the throttle is eased so that you don't stay over the speed limit. This is achieved with a PID controller, that is, by definition, a closed loop control system which adjusts its behaviour in response to external events. I think that's convincing enough on its own, but we can make this claim even stronger by looking at level 1 lateral control, steering, and considering lane centering. Lane centering keeps a vehicle in its lane over a prolonged period of time and responds to changing topology in the road, like when you're going around a curve or the widening or narrowing of lane lines, and it adjusts the steering angle accordingly. Lane centering doesn't have to respond to the presence of other vehicles coming into its lane that's outside the required behaviour. So there's already precedence showing that external events doesn't have to mean other vehicles, but it can just mean stuff changing around the vehicle. So either conventional cruise control is actually level 1, or lane centering should join conventional cruise control in level 0, because they both don't react to the presence of other vehicles. Basically, my argument for upgrading conventional cruise control to level 1 relies on holding lane centering hostage, and I think most reasonable people will agree that they should both be level 1. We then change the standard, prove John or wrong, and call it a day. At least, that's what I thought. I mean... Here I am, sitting amongst a task force that's developing definitions for public discourse in the industry. This is a really important standard. It lets us, not just engineers, but the media, lawyers, the public, and everyone in between, be sure that we're referencing the same thing. It's right there on the front page. I've made my views clear on how unhappy I am with some of the elements of SAE J3016, and here I am, in a position to put forward changes to the standard, I shouldn't be using this position to only prove someone wrong on the internet. This is an opportunity to actually put forward some big changes that I think are long overdue. And maybe also prove someone wrong on the internet as a sort of side quest mission thing. So what's the big change? Well I've spent the better part of two years now engaging with people on the internet about autonomous vehicles, both on YouTube and on Twitter. And something that comes up all the time is how obsessed people are with level 5. From people claiming that anything achieved by the current autonomous vehicles companies is bad because it's not level 5 yet, because it's geofenced or on a restricted ODD or whatever reason, even though they are literally driving vehicles with no drivers. To people claiming that some level 2 driver assistance systems are just months away from level 5. We have companies naming themselves after level 5, not to mention how common the phrase the race to level 5 is, which just needs to stop. But 
what is level 5? What are the limitations of it? And what does a level 5 system actually look like? In SAEJ3016, it says that level 5 is an automated system with an unlimited ODD. Or does it? Well, it actually does say it's an unlimited ODD, but then it adds the caveat that it's only unlimited in the sense of where a driver is reasonably expected to drive. So driving across mountain ranges or doing cross countries on dirt tracks may fall outside its capability, and I'm okay with that limitation. But then we have further issues. If a level 5 system comes across a road which you can't travel on, then it can still maintain its level 5 status, only now it's not an ideal level 5. I can also accept that to a certain degree. But then comes section 8.8 .8 titled Practical Considerations Regarding Level 5. This section says that if a level 5 vehicle cannot operate on a road for legal or business constraints, then it can still be referred to as level 5. So if a US level 5 vehicle can't operate in an automated way in Mexico for legal reasons, it's still level 5. Fine. But then we come to business constraints. So if a company has a level 5 vehicle but they limit where it can drive due to business constraints that they have, say they don't want their vehicles operating outside a specific metro area or they just don't have enough money to look after a fleet which goes to a particular place, then the vehicle can be limited from going there and still be considered level 5. The reasoning given here is that since the constraints are legal and or business related rather than technological, then the level 5 title can stay. But that completely ignores the fact that legal, business and technological constraints can align with one another, even artificially. For example, and hypothetically, Waymo can decide we only want to operate in this specific area of Arizona and this specific area of San Francisco and we are not expanding our coverage due to our leadership, simply just not feeling like it's worth it. That's a business reason, and if they did that it means Waymo could call themselves level 5 today. Essentially, a level 5 vehicle will have an ODD, just not one set by technical capability necessarily, but by legal and business limitations. And the business ones especially can be completely arbitrary and gamed to overlap the technical limitations. This is a far, far cry from the unlimited ODD that most people understand level 5 to mean when they look at this table instead of actually reading the standard. In fact, since level 5's unlimited ODD is actually going to be limited in some way, that means the border between level 4 and level 5 is fuzzy and arbitrary. But let's look at this another way, and let's go back to what the levels mean. SAE J3016 divides responsibility of various aspects of the dynamic driving task, video here, between a human driver and an automated system across a discrete spectrum. Starting off from level 0, all aspects of the DDT are handled manually by the human. As you go up each level, one more aspect of the DDT gets handed over from the human to the automated system. But then we get to the border between level 4 and level 5. There's actually no more DDT elements to hand over, a level 4 vehicle is completely autonomous. The difference is based on the operational design domain, which sit outside the dynamic driving task. There's another argument, which states that level 5 is supposed to be the antithesis to level 0. I can accept that, but isn't level 4 as well? The only difference between level 4 and level 5 is an unlimited ODD. Vehicle levels 1, 2 and 3 can theoretically also have unlimited ODDs and stay the same level, but when level 4 does it, then it magically becomes level 5. If you look only at the dynamic driving task, then level 4 is just as much an antithesis to level 0 as level 5 is. I think this distinction has no place in J3016. In fact, the Definition Task Force is currently working on a new standard, SAE J3259, which will describe ODDs. There's a very natural split here, where J3016 covers DDT and J3259 covers ODD. I'm not a fan of level 5, it just feels like it's this awkward patch on SAE J3016 which doesn't fit with the rest, and it shows. There's caveats on caveats, and what it actually is doesn't really line up with what people understand it as, and that's a real problem for a standard which is aimed at informing public discourse. I'm proposing that we get rid of level 5. I think level 5 needs to die, and I think the industry will be better off for it. 
For one, we already know that level 5 vehicles are going to have restrictions, but since they're commonly understood to not have them, then companies can be very non-specific about what their level 5 solutions will actually look like. If we redefine level 5 as just a level 4 vehicle with a very wide ODT, then being specific about the final products that these companies are delivering will be necessary. We also get rid of the ridiculous notion that this is a race. We have level 4 vehicles out on the road now. There'd be no more step to level up to. The real race or battle, if you want to use language like that, are in ODDs. We're already there, and rather than orbiting this weird level 5 concept that doesn't even make sense in the first place, we need to start talking about ODDs. If you ask me what the most common pitfall of public discourse is around autonomous vehicles, ODD takes the number one spot. And not just for level 4 vehicles, but for all vehicles. The well of public discourse has really been poisoned over the years with marketing and irresponsible claims from prominent companies. There's even a section in J3016 highlighting words that technical people should avoid because of the problematic way they've been used. This confusion has done a real disservice to public discourse. We see people involved in accidents because they believed that their driver assistance vehicles were able to work everywhere, but if you look closely, the actual ODD is hidden away on a little note in a 300 page manual. When ambitious companies come along and say that their level 5 vehicles are going to work everywhere, they need to be pressed on that and asked what they mean by everywhere. Because it's not going to really be everywhere. The operational design domain of automated and driver assistance systems needs to be front and center when we speak about and advertise this technology. And what better way to make sure this happens than by removing the notion of unlimited from autonomous vehicles. And the best way of doing that is by removing level 5. I understand the urge to have a theoretical maximum regardless of whether or not it's achievable. But look at the front page of SAEJ3016 again. This standard is there to help people understand, and if your theoretical bookend is achieving the opposite, then maybe it has no place on the shelf. Thanks for coming to my TED talk. I'll update you with how things go with my items when they're up for discussion, but I'm interested to hear what you think. Do you think level 5 needs to die, and how wrong is Jono about cruise control, which is so obviously level 1? Are there any changes that you think should happen to J3016 that you'd like me to take to the task force? Tell me about it in the comments below, or tag me on Twitter. Links in the description, subscribe if you like me. Okay, bye.